Kevin Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brett. Great to be here. So you got a, a biography out about Henry David Thoreau. This is a, an Ameri- quintessentially American character that a lot of people have written about him because he's had such a, a big influence, not only on American letters, but just you know, people, like, I mean, a big cultural impact worldwide. I'm curious, how is your biography different from all the different Thoreau biographies that are out there? Oh, well, let's put it this way. Let's cut to the chase. When uh, the Wall Street Journal headlined their review of, of my book with Thoreau Believed in Fairies, <laughs> I guess that says it all. Um, you know, I'm caricaturing it, but my, I would like to say that I practice, my biography is different from all the others in that I actually practice a Thoreauvian manner of studying Henry, the way Henry approached the world. And that was my intention. I don't know how, how, uh, faithful I was to that method, but yeah, I would say that I, I tried to read Thoreau like he read the world. Yeah, I mean, because you dig in, it's it's basically the way I I would describe when people were, at, when I was telling people I'm re- you know reading this book and I'll be having you on the podcast, it is basically a biography of Thoreau's, we could say, mystic beliefs that influenced his, his writing. Okay, now I want to take you to the mat on this right away, Brett. Okay. Uh, and please don't take it personally. Mystic. This is a, this is a, a slippery word. Right. And I was thinking, did I use the word mystic? I saw it in all of the <laughs> the reviews and even my own editor probably, you know, wove it in there. But I don't think I myself used it. Now, uh, Thoreau famously, when he replied to the, when the American Association for the Events and Science asked him to, you know, say what he was since he was a member of the AAAS. And he said, I'm a mystic a natural philosopher and a transcendentalist to boot. You know, he himself used it, but probably the word that I would use to describe him is he was a phenomenologist. Now that's a, that's too many syllables, right? (laughs) For us to, to get our, uh, our lips and our tongue around. But, uh, that, you know, simply put it, he is somebody who aimed always at describing what was in front of him without theory, but to let the, th- let the phenomena themselves be their own theory. And when you're a biographer, this is my first crack at a biography, that's a really good rule of thumb to approach a subject is to let the phenomenon, the, the, the life of the character you're studying, let that be the driver. Let that be all, always the beacon that guides your own inquiry. Rather than bringing you know a bunch of your own inner subjectivity to it, so yeah, mystic. I feel like especially for you, you fra- you 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 formed this very nicely at the beginning about him being an American character. Well, America doesn't really have a mystical tradition, a really strong and and well grounded mystical tradition. I would like to th- think of Thoreau as having instead founded a new a new nature study. That we that really to this day we haven't followed up on. But with that, I mean, as, I guess I was reading. I guess you said I was reading it from like my modern perspective. And as you read you know, Thoreau's journal entries, and then we'll, we can get into some of the the things that were going on in America at the time of his you know his youth and when he was really prolific. But I mean, the thing that that I guess surprised me was, I mean, may, may, I would describe it as mystic. I would, you could all say magical. Right, because we we live in such a very scientific analytical. Bravo, you know, ra- that's beautiful. You know, that that yeah. but like you know some of the things that you know you talk about Thoreau believing in fairies. Right, he talks about fairies as sort of this phenomenal phenomenological experience that he had. And it wasn't just Thoreau. I mean, there were you know pockets in America that were combining all sorts of interesting things with you know astrology and 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 religion and christianity I mean, it was just it was a completely i guess i would say foreign world for us living in the 21st century yeah that's a that's a beautiful way to describe it yeah you know the the present always reads itself into the past and you know look at us we've become a totally non-magical non-enchanted alienated america <laughs> so and that that didn't just start you know now 
I'd say the previous generations of biographers of Thoreau were sharing that experience. But it, it was it, it was very, very strange to me that none of them had had caught the fact that, yeah, that what was central to his biography from from his youth on was the fact that he did with clear and exacting eyes look upon the natural world and in it he you know he had this empathic sympathetic to use a, a an antebellum a favorite keyword sympathy which was through the heart forces not through the head but he was he was looking at the world studying it in great detail in exacting detail and in a way, you know, had a conversation. He had a heartfelt conversation. It was a, it was very much a romantic science. It was not a head science and, and argued both explicitly, implicitly for that. And I think that that's what, that's what every generation of young people responds to. It's a very, very complex voice that he has, but, uh, it's unmistakably universal and I think timeless. So this this love affair with Henry is not going to end. It's going to carry on for, you know, centuries and centuries. Absolutely right. Because I mean, when you read Thoreau, like you feel like yeah, you you feel that reenchantment, right? You think, oh my goodness, like the world is full of possibility. It's full of mystery that can be explored, and that maybe not doesn't even have to be explored. You can just enjoy the mystery. Oh, I, I think that's the perfect way to describe it. That an enchantment in the like in a Renaissance. Uh, sense of the world word it means a kind of a binding a, a binding of oneself in a very very heartfelt way to the to the phenomena the the possibility that that there's a reciprocity that there's actually the outside out there is in you and you can be in it and i guess that you know to circle back to my my little um you know harsh stance about mystic the mystic to me goes inside in order to reach God. And clearly Thoreau and transcendentalism is about going outside, going going into one's surroundings and through that to go through the the, the illusion, the the appearances to the higher the higher realm. That's the thing that America seems cut out to do, you know? It <laughs> there's not we don't have too many um ex X Games level mystics, you know, people who go inward. We're not we're not that good at meditation and at inner exploration, but we're man oh man, are we crazy for for um for outer explore, exploration? You know whether we you know we got these characters sending up you know things into outer space and so on, and and I think that that was that Thoreau pioneered that that path, which is a kind of Rosicrucian ancient path of through nature to God. Well, let, let's talk about the, this development of this worldview of his. What was his childhood like? Did did Thoreau hint that he was going to be this guy that would write Walden and write these poems about nature? Or was this something that developed, you know, as he entered young manhood? Oh, great question, Brett. I mean, this is the, this is the interesting thing about, about, uh, becoming a biographer is do the do these signatures do these hallmarks do these gestures do they leap out immediately with Thoreau you have a an incredibly generous subject in that he wrote two million words into a journal you know starting when he was just a teenager so I would say you know the gesture that I that I felt from the very beginning that his life showed is he had a gift for expansiveness, uh, for ecstasy. He had a gift for relationship and it was there, you know, my own daughter, the minute she could walk, she was dancing and singing, you know, and boom, you know, she's now 41 and she's dancing and singing. And, and I, you know, I think that each of us, especially if we're expressive, the gestures, the main gestures we carry out of the cosmos into our human being, they show up really early. And, you know, one of the cool things was that when he was just in his early 20s, he sat his mother down and he interviewed his mother. He was he had a, a very intense and wonderful relationship with his mother, closer than, than to his father. And 
he would catch these he'd catch these little things in his journal over a, a, a about a month period of time where he's he's getting the stories of his own childhood from from her something that is so telling for a young adult when both what does their mother say about them and then what do they what do they then hold close and i think that there was a real consonance between what his mother remembered was his essence and what he took in as being his 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 own life's journey, his own life's imprint. Yeah, I think one of the stories I remember reading was, he, you know, as a boy, I think his mother said that he went off and you just go look at the stars for hours on end. And well, even that the, the the thing that he records in his journal is that they had a trundle bed, and this will this will help take us back, you know, out of the 21st century into the 1820s. You know, it wasn't uncommon for people to share beds back in the day, you know, the, a lot of people in smaller spaces than bigger families. And uh, even though there were just three children in the, in the Thoreau family, he and his brother, John slept in what was called a trundle bed. It, it pulled out from underneath the parents' bed, like a Murphy bed kind of a thing out of the wall. And that, you know, she would, she would catch him at the window at night, you know, having left the bed and looking out at the stars. So, yeah, it was a deep yearning in him from infancy, practically. I mean, did his family, were they, I mean, how would I say this? Were they romantic, poetic, religious? Did and that kind of help flesh that stuff out in Thoreau's life? Well, my, the the picture I, I very much got is of, you know, a father who had mouths to feed. He had a, had a family. He was a man on the make at a time when, you know, in New England, when, the economy was shifting and he had to be he had to be light on his feet to figure out how to how to prosper and he he really didn't have the luxury of of reading greek philosophy <laughs> you know he didn't have the the higher education that that henry was able to get at harvard he was he was a working father you know really really working and his mother i think had a very romantic poetic soul and they you know Henry famously said, I was born in the nick of time and in, let's say, well, excuse me, I was born in the right place and the right time, you know, that there is a, in a sense, I think that that has to stem not just from the uh, conquered, but his own family. He had a sense that they gave him just what he needed to, yeah, to become himself truly. And what I thought was interesting too, when you highlight, I mean, it's not only a biography of Thoreau, it is a biography of early America, particularly New England. What, what I was, I thought it was really fascinating was the culture in New England. It was, there was a lot of magic going on. I guess like it's a, there was like a magic worldview going on, like, like folk magic, I guess you could call it. Like farmers would use the almanac that had, you know, you need a plant under this certain moon because it's going to reap a better whatever. And they, they kind of like everyone had that. Like, they kind of lived by it, but also was side by side was like the Bible and Christianity. And now today, us Americans think those things are incompatible. But somehow people in New England at the time thought, no, it's perfectly compatible. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think here's the picture that we could, we could very, very safely assume that what was the book that more households had than any other book, you know, between 1820 and 1850 it was the Bible. And yes, there were all these amazing folk practices. Probably, I w- I'm, this, I'm inventing this right now. It's com- just completely on a hunch. But I'd say the most common form of divination, the most common form of folk magic was to flip the Bible open, to a- inwardly ask a question, and then flip the Bible open, and then put your finger on a passage. Yeah, I think people, yeah, I think people still was, do that today. That was the, well, I don't know what the, the modern day equivalent would be, but... There you go. Boom. Everybody was doing that. Is it like bibliomancracy? Is that what it's called? Biblio? I don't know. You know, the old, the old uh, term for this was the sortus virgilantes, which in, in, uh, in classical times, they used Virgil, the great Roman poet. And instead, of, you know, they, they saw his knowledge as being so cosmic and, and all-encompassing that the answers would be there. And the thing about divination is that anything can be a divination device. 
you know, certainly the internet can be a divination device. In fact, that's, you know, that's, uh, the most uh, interesting thing is to think about how in a world of digital text rather than, than printed texts, if magic is real, then it's still got to be operative in whatever the technology of the times is. And so I think that the prophecy, divination, these, these questions about how am I going to get along? Who am I? You know, what's going to happen around the bend? They're, they're universal questions. And you're, you know, you're, you're pointing to my contextualizing Thoreau in this way. A, a big part of that was a signature I found right away was this sense, you know, I used it for the title of the book, expect great things. So his mantra was that he said in a hundred different ways, in the long run, we find what we expect. We shall be fortunate then if we expect great things. And whether it's astrology or uh, reading tea leaves, the operative principle of magic is that what we think manifests in the world as being real and that's what his that's what his mantra was expect great things now that's <laughs> that's a great challenge if in in a personal way but also in a national way because of a lot of what i tried to do in the book was to consider this with because thoreau had a certain sense of himself as a prophet and a prophet has to be has to be approved and in a sense designated by his community or her community but uh, the prophetic tradition was strong enough in his lifetime it was carried mainly through poetry and that was a lot to do with his relationship with emerson uh, and the expectation that that poetry would carry that prophetic that prophetic tradition forward and would would ennoble the people as they they strove to be this new nation i mean that, yeah it sounds like that world view I mean, I guess the way I contrast this, as I was reading, is Thoreau, Emerson, and a lot of people living in New England and in America at the time, it was, the, the sense of self was very porous, right? Like the self could influence the outside world in, I don't know, unexplainable ways. And the outside world could also influence the self. I think- Oh, to, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think today we're very rigid. We think like, well, there's, there's us and then there's the outside world. And that's a, that's it. Like they're separate, and there's no real interaction or play going on there. Yes, and and I mean it's ironic as you say this, Brett, because what immediately came into my mind, particularly, was in relationships and close friendship, because the emphasis and the the quality of friendship in that era was was very very amazing. I think if you study you know, people of letters of that time, which is the easiest way to do it. Uh, and, you know, we pride ourselves on all of our kind of openness about gender and, and so on about relationship. But there was a tremendous amount of real intense love relationship between men, between women at that time was, which was, was seen as, as really a high ideal a great a high ideal and i and i think about you know the porous as you said the the porous self you know we have a certain you know today we have all of these avenues and technologies to play with the self and seemingly for the self to be porous but the self isn't strong enough the the, the identity formation seems to be weak to meet these technologies in a way it feels to me and uh, you know i forgive my own romanticism here but i got a sense of the antebellum era they were by the time they were 18 by the time they were 20 these young adults had identity formations that were so strong that that kind of to lose oneself into another or to lose oneself into a philosophy or to lose oneself into nature were were benign and possibly life enhancing both for for the individual and for the community in a way that uh, is much more problematic today i think yeah i think we kind of keep things at arm's distance today and we're we're i i think that's where I, irony comes in we use irony as a way to protect the self right it's like 
you, you never want to admit that you're idealistic because if <laughs> if it doesn't work out the way you you thought you'd be, you'd be like, well, I was just I was just joking, right? Um, mm. It's sort of I see a lot of that going on. I mean, I find myself doing that too. <laughs> well, no, I know it's the 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 rhetoric and the stance of irony is uh, it's a deeply tragic. Uh, I, this this is this is really crazy, but I can remember the very first college class I I taught, and this would be you know back in the right right around 1990 probably, and I had been a, a bit of a luddite. I, I I prided myself on not having a television, but teaching college, you know, it was it was all about whatever was on on TV, and I remember coming in. One Monday, this was a, a an undergraduate class, a little community college in, in Burlington, Vermont. And the all of a sudden, somebody said something like "not." They said something. They said "not," and I didn't. And it was the beginning of I don't know if it's still around, but it, I think it had come from Saturday Night Live or something. It was stating something as a positive very strongly, and then going "not," almost like pulling the rug out from under you. It's a it's a dirty trick. If it's not irony, healthy irony can be strong and life enhancing. But this was a kind of a, um, I think the the beginning of the road to the kind of relativism and and crazy inability to distinguish reality from illusion that we that we swim in today. Yeah, I think today the so saying not. I remember I remember when that happened because I remember as a middle school kid and you do that all the time because oh as a middle school kid yeah now was, can you imagine i mean uh, forgive me my my you know my pollyannishness but no a middle kid a m- middle school kid that's not fair to have to have you know it may be in very very intimate situations where the one to whom you're practicing irony has a strong enough relationship to you as a friend that you know you can be learning about yourself through playing with those things but i think you know we're steeped in this from such a, a youthful age how do we find how do we swim towards the truth when we're just surrounded by tropes and yeah it's it's a it very is. very it's a very very difficult time in this way no, it is. I think today, instead of not, it's, you know, LOL, JK, which is laugh out loud, just kidding when, when you say something. But as, yeah, like, as a kid, like I've got two young kids. What I, one of the things that's so refreshing about kids and one of the great things about having kids when they're at this young age is you see how unabashedly like they throw themselves into it. Like there's no, there's not a hint of guile at all. Yes, like, absolutely. And, and, I, and absolutely. I, I, I guess that was like the challenge of Thoreau. Thoreau was like, his life's work is how can I keep that even as I move into adulthood and I learn more about the world and where you can get cynical and jaded, but like not get cynical and jaded. Yeah. Well, it, it, this is so such an interesting turn of the conversation because I, all of a sudden I feel like I want to go back and rewrite the biography in, in light of these questions you're asking, because they have become so, so pressing upon us at, at this time. And, he himself in you know in studying him he kept them at bay because you really i mean he had his struggles um as a as a young man in terms of what society expected of him and reconciling his own ideas of of true true success um he you know he had a a, a positively acid disdain for bourgeois norms that you know put him in trouble with with lots of people from the very beginning but i think he had a sense of himself as so divinely favored that nothing that could come at him would have shaken his conviction he just he really had a strong sense that he was divinely favored but not in a way of narcissistically but truly in a way of as a servant of of his community of of humanity in the larger sense that he was gifted by by this sense of being supported by the invisible world in a in a you know it just never wavered that never wavered his his own ability to 
carry out his his writing ambitions, you know, his goals in, in, in creatively, that he may have faltered, but it, the other never, ever wavered. And, it, you know, he never got it from any institutional church. He, he cultivated that just through his experience of, of spiritual beings that I think visited him on a regular basis. I think that it's as clear as that. And that's, that's the place where I run afoul and where my biography is different. I consider spiritual beings to be real. I have, it's my experience my whole life. And, and so why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I accept that as being, when he says it, I know it's true. You know, I don't gloss over it or I don't ignore it. I take it to be central. It's the central thing that, oh, that, a century and a half of biographies just missed, you know, totally missed. Well, yeah, I mean, this kind of nice, leads nicely to that idea exploring, you know, the Wall Street Journal's headline, Thoreau Believed in Fairies. When you dig, you get into this a bit where he would be out on a walk in nature and with a child or with another person and he would say, I saw a fairy there or there's, there's some sort of being here. And I think a lot of people, you know, I think the modern 21st century approach would be like, well, he's being metaphorical. But I mean, you make it the case. No, he actually, he actually, he believed in those spiritual beings that were there. And they were. Well, or, you know, what I wanted to say to the, to, uh, to the Wall Street Journal was, no, he didn't believe in fairies. He communicated with them. They communicated with him. He had, you know, the problem is the word fairies, I think, Brett. I, I like the word elemental beings, but, you know, every single culture throughout history up and through modernity has had these experiences. And he was living in a time when they certainly the, his rural neighbors, his uneducated neighbors were steeped in this. They, they had those experiences too, and they weren't afraid to speak of them. In fact, they were very central to their, to their lives. But educated people were increasingly not supposed to t- talk about that. And, you know, so my own, what I think was the central discovery, uh, here's how it happened. Uh, you know, I, what I did when I was, when I was given the task uh, to write a biography of Thoreau, I, I elected to write this book, being invited to write about any environmentalist of my choosing. So I chose my own boyhood hero, uh, Henry. And when I opened, I thought the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read his journal. I thought that was would be the most immediate way to put myself in his shoes, not by the essays and not certainly not by the books that I had read and fallen in love with, but just, just to go to the journals. And at the very beginning of his journal, he tells this little story about being out with his brother walking. And it happened about six weeks before he wrote about it in his journal. He said, a curious thing happened the other day. And here he was six weeks later, and it was it was bugging him. He didn't understand it, that he was out on this walk, and he uh, was making a little rhetorical flourish about Ta Tawan, the, uh, the Wampanoag chieftain locally. And he said, there stood Ta Tawan's hut, and here is Ta Tawan's arrowhead. And he reaches down for this stone, and he picks up the stone. And when he flourishes it to his brother John, he's looking at a perfectly shaped arrowhead. So he tells this little story. It's the, it's the first story in his whole journal of two million words. First time he actually tells a personal story. And he says, you know, this basically saying, you know, what? How did that happen? He, 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 he intuits that he had a thought and then his thought became manifest and it was a magical action and he doesn't have an explanation for it. Well, I've had lots of things like that happen to me in my life and I was similarly mystified what the heck is going on, you know, and you can't turn to anybody, you know, there's nobody who can explain it for you. You basically have to just pay attention to your own life and start studying it. And then you'll find the answer. (laughs) You know, that's what, that's what living in a disenchanted age will do. And so lo and behold, you know, having him caught my attention because I had a similar question in my mind when I found, you know, I began to find these poems where he's basically uh, secretly disvul- divulging his relationship with these beings, uh, you know, I could completely under, I could hear, I could hear them, 
because I had, I had come through the same mystery. I'd come through the same path. And, you know, it's a, it's a pretty solitary path. Uh, in the modern world. Right. Because I think the, uh, the explanation that we would give, like, well, that was just a coincidence. Right. And, you know, I have a little book I wrote called How Things Find Us that is is my explanation that everybody I talk to, eventually I can, f- I can get them, even if they think they haven't had elemental beings working for them, I can get them to tell me a story that, you know, where things were and they use this word synchronicity, you know, Carl Jung's uh, word. It's a complete back black box. Synchronicity is a, it's a faint. It's a, it's not a helpful explanation. It's a non-explanation. It's a way of a materialist mindset using a Greek word that sounds scientific that means absolutely nothing. It's actually a tautology. We are afraid in the modern world to talk about beings, about spiritual beings, you know, and that's the last frontier until we until we begin abandoning this insipid language this new age language of of energy and forces and talk about beings we're doomed i think yeah i guess what as i was reading about his you know his conception of these beings it reminded me it's very roman very greek like the romans believed in a genius that everyone was assigned or the the greeks the diamonds the the you know demons i guess or like like good demons like they're a little like basically kind of like the they're that like help you inspire you muses etc yeah and they were they were close enough look you know the average all the all those harvard undergrads you know emerson's generation thoreau's both and maybe a generation after him they all had to read the ancients. They had to read them in the original Greek and Latin, you know, and and it brought them very close to that world. You know, Nathaniel Hawthorne, their their peer, their peer, you know, his undergraduate pen name was Oberon, the king of the fairies. You know, Louisa May Alcott, you know, she wrote a fairy books for the for the kids. They were all steeped in that world and. When they, when they went over the border from childhood to adulthood, they didn't give it up easily because they were still, they're still kind of close to a kind of sense of that these were, these were relationships. They weren't imagined, but they were, they were real. And I, I think that that's really the, you know, this is the, what's the greatest, um, diagnostic of this that, that Harry Potter, is the biggest publishing phenomenon of all time. Kids, kids are magical beings. Children are magical beings. They, they come into the world to do magic and to be magical. And then, unfortunately, we presented them a muggle, a muggle world, you know. The, the unfortunate thing is that it was presented as a fiction and that J.K. Rowling herself doesn't actually understand magic, doesn't understand the principles. You know, if I were to, if I were to, uh, set up my, um, my ideal university, my Hogwarts, I'd start kids out with, with, with Walden and with Thoreau. He's, he knows the flora and the fauna backwards and forwards as well as anybody could. He is as grounded in the phenomenal world in a rooted and real way as he's a better naturalist than any naturalist that's out there today. And, discovered more laws and principles than, you know, your E.O. Wilson or any of these other characters. And he, he also understood that thoughts are things, thoughts influence the world. And that's the essence of magical, a magical uh, worldview. Yeah. And this reminds me a lot of, uh, we've had a guest on talking about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and their inkblot society. And like they they were writing about the same time, like fairy, like that was the thing they talked about. And like Tolkien's sole object with the the Lord of the Rings was to re-enchant the world. Like they both these guys saw, you know, they saw the horrors of World War One, of mechanized warfare, what it did to the environment. And Tolkien wanted to create this world, the Middle Earth, where it wasn't like that. And like you could sculpt your world in a way that's idealistic and, and romantic. Mm. And uh, uh, absolutely, Brett. And Again, I may be completely talking out of my hat here, but so if you think about the inklings in the twenties and inter, you know, in in between the wars, and they were educated enough 
and living close to the land enough um, in a pre-digital age that through the literary imagination, uh, they were, they were basically creating worlds, right? The problem has been that the 21st century has taken these creations and they've turned them into virtual realities, right? So that young and old are entering them as substitutes for developing the relationships. Whereas a hundred years ago, I think they were portals. And even maybe when I was, uh, you know, when I was a teenager and I was first reading the Lord of the Rings, you know, decades after it had been written, but in the milieu of the, you know, late sixties, early seventies, there was the possibility of that re-enchantment that you're speaking of. But now we have these cinematic and highly pixelated simulacra that present themselves as their their wonderfully rich and inviting landscapes for the imagination but they don't do i think what what tolkien and and charles williams and you know c.s lewis were doing which was they were doing like what thoreau was doing with walden they were they were trying to to paint pictures with words that invited people into the spiritual world. And in a way, the world of Hollywood is a spiritual world. It's been generated from human beings, from their imagination. But I, I feel it's a fallen spiritual world that what Thoreau offered and that era between, um, uh, bet- let's say between 1800 and, and 1850, that romantic era, it there was a possibility for a different natural science, uh, a different way which would honor actual beings that by by opening up to them as and and inviting conversation with them, then one could build and restore and redeem nature in a way that now we stand largely out of it. We don't have a conversation with it. We have a with the beings of nature. Um, we have a kind of reductive analytical relationship. We have an extremely reductive science, and then we have an extremely a sort of luciferic, imaginative dream life that is is given digital expression. And in between, we need to bring the human heart into conversation with the beings because our children still, our children more than ever are having relationships with these beings, and we got to wake up to it. Let's talk about what exactly Thoreau did to commune or his, you know, because like, as you said, Americans aren't like contemplatives in say Europe where they, you know, go to a monastery and they're just sitting there meditating. Ours is more, it's outward turning. So what sort of outward meditations did Thoreau take part in where he got these insights, but not only was he doing, getting those insights about the spiritual life, like he was getting incredible insights about just the natural world and and how it worked. Yeah, it was, you know, I hate to be, I hate to oversimplify, but it was close observation. It was faithful, repetitive observation. His method, if he had any method, it was describe, describe again, and describe a third time. And out of that description, would emerge an answer to a mystery. So, you know, let's, the, the most spectacular and, and delightful example is, is Walden Pond. You know, I think every kid who grows up in the suburbs in America grows up with places that are supposed to be unfathomable. You know, it's where the boogeyman lives or, you know, there's something, something that the whole community feels like there be dragons, even in this disenchanted age. And for him in, in Concord, Walden Pond was supposed to be bottomless. And just think of this. Think of this as a gesture that generation after generation grows up with this, you know, hearsay that Walden Pond is bottomless. 
and you know once he's built his cabin on Emerson's land out there and spends his two years, the first winter he goes out with a plumb bob and a line, and he drills a couple of hundred holes in the pond, and not only does he discover that it ain't bob- bottomless and that you can map out the cartography of the bottom of Walden Pond, but he discovers an, a law. He discovers that the intersection of the the shortest dimension across the pond and the longest dimension of the pond will be its deepest place. And then geologists and other observers after him discovered that this is a this is a general law. He didn't go out looking to discover a general law. He went out to answer a local mystery. And by measurement, he found the answer. And the, the answer actually opened out to a general law. This is a deep lesson for us that live in a world of abstraction and theory. If we would just pay attention and just make repeated observations, we could turn natural science inside out. Yeah, that was sort of the interesting, I don't know what you call it, a paradox, because you know, as you read Thoreau's writing, it's very romantic, very spiritual. But at the same time, he, he wasn't he wasn't a humbug. I wouldn't call him that, but like he wanted to really know how the world worked. He didn't, he wasn't, he wanted his spiritual life to be based in reality. Would that be a fair way to describe it? Like he didn't want to, I mean, cause I, that, that perfect example right there, if he was just a complete, you know, romantic, he would go along with, oh yeah, the, you know, Walden Pond is bottomless, but he's like, no, I'm going to actually find out what's going on here. No, I mean, I, I w- wish I had um, all of the, the quotes at my tongue, but in this, you know, in this seemingly new world of fake news, right? Shams and delusions are deemed, you know, that that his era was paying attention to shams and delusions. And that the actual, the actual, you know, put your foot, his, his, his philosophy was put your foot through the shams and delusions and touch bottom. <laughs> the bottom is always there. You just bring your soul forces to bear on it. And you will discover the fact behind the illusion. It's it's that simple. So he never failed to um, to practice that. And I think that he lived in a kind of there was a certain e- explosion of of uh, of a lot of illusion at that time that put him at odds with with his fellow with his both his neighbors and and certainly as a philosopher as a philosopher, you know, he was, he was a great wordsmith and what loved wordplay. And most, most of his greatest revelations are kind of hidden between the lines. So he was, he was using, in a sense, he was using the oldest rhetorical craft in a book, which was to make the reader work, make the reader discover the truths not make them, but invite the reader into uh, the kind of play that he had. And with both in the world and his observational practice and in his science and in the way he worked as a literary person, it really put him at odds, which was more his, the, the mainstream was to, to dazzle and to not to illumine, but to falsely illumine very much his entire I think, and this is why he's he'll be universal, is that he got to the the truth in a timeless fashion, not through theory but through observation. Yeah, and the way he observed, I mean, that's people think, well, that's really easy. No, it was really hard work. Like I, I think I re- encountered one thing where he'd like just stare and look at a, a tree or a pond for ten hours, like <laughs> just sitting there looking. And you know, to me, living in the twenty first century, where my brain has been destroyed by all this distraction like that just seems like really hard to do really 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 hard to do and uh you know to historians love counterfactual arguments they love to you know if uh, to to put some counter scenario into the past and then run it forward in time and you know i studied science before i became a historian and and practiced science and and taught science and in a way, I feel like there was an alternative natural science fully efflorescing in in that antebellum era, both in Europe and in the United States, 
And it certainly was in those places. It wasn't anywhere on any other, in any other place in the world where it was, was being um, developed. And it could have been what I, when I went to school, when I took biology and I took physics, that could have been my pedagogy. It could have been your pedagogy and it would have been our children's. And unfortunately, it, it, it's rarely, it's very, very difficult to find uh, a phenomenological scientific practice. Instead, what we have are these buffoons parading around as oracles, you know, guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, Carl Sagan, that are, are showmen that, that are, that are, are, in, that they are also distractions. They're not actually imparting a, a simple and faithful uh, scientific practice. They're, they're encouraging abstraction, I, I fear. Besides the, the observation, the intense observation, you, you talk about, oftentimes we think of Thoreau as just sort of this guy that hung out by a cabin, but he was a really hardy guy. Like, I, I was amazed at some of the walks he would go on. Like, we think of a walk, like, I'm, it's around the block, it's a mile. Like, he would go on 20 mile hikes, basically. To get to someplace, he wouldn't go by horse or carriage. He would just he would walk there if he needed to get someplace. And like along the way, he was making observations as well. Yeah, I mean it was a it was a a habit with him. I think that he he knew very on that early on the deep pleasure of just the rhythm of of simple walking, and he also knew in that era that the rewards of walking were immense. That you encountered things that you you couldn't encounter on horseback or certainly on the on the railroad and yeah i don't i think that in a way if you think about whether it was on cape cod or in maine or you know walking to fitchburg or or walking <laughs> here's here's the thing when he was 17 18 years old if he had a deep question and he thought that he might find the answer in the library at Harvard. He'd walked. He'd walked to Cambridge from Concord. <laughs> just think of that. Forgive me. I got. I just got to tell this story. I remember when my daughter was like, I don't know, nine years old, and we were. This was up in Vermont, and we lived on a on this long dirt road. And I had told her we were doing the shopping, and I told her you can't have any. Candy, you know, the kids are always reaching for the candy. And uh, sure enough, she wanted the candy in the checkout line. I said, okay, but you cannot have it, you know, till tomorrow or whatever. And sure enough, we're in the car driving home, and she reaches back, and she gets the candy. So I take it, and I throw it out the window. This is little kid, tiny little legs. We pull into, you know, at home. And she walks a half a mile and goes into the swamp and finds it and, you know, brings it back. That kind of, that incredible determination a kid can have. So now think of a 17, 18-year-old Thoreau. He has a question, and he walks to Cambridge, to the library at Harvard, to, to help answer the question. And he never lost that. If he had a question, yeah, he, he would walk there to, to get the answer. And, and so it was a habit that he developed early. And um, it's a beautiful habit. It's a, it's a timeless habit. It's, it's one that, you know, I, in a way, if I were to say how, how Henry – gave me a model for my life. It, I've, I've been walking places to answer questions my whole life. I, instead of doing a book tour for this biography, I, I walked from the foot of Broadway up to, up to Walden Pond and then wrote a book about it. <laughs> you know, so I, this man has made a deep impact on me, that's for sure. Yeah, I think there's something about walking. We've written about this on the, the website. Uh, there's a Latin phrase, solvitar abolando, it is solved by walking. Mm, beautiful you know, beautiful amazing whenever you go on a good walk what what sorts of ideas you get that you don't get when you're driving in a car or in the shower seems like i'm sure like i'm thorough when he was going to harvard walking to harvard i'm sure he was coming up with answers even while he was walking and then he found some insight and on the way back the walk allowed him to digest that and even gain even more insight yeah and and i would say brett that um you know i used to i walked from one time from from Montreal to Manhattan, and I I did programs at schools along the way, and I would tell the kids because people would ask me, "Can I walk with you?" And I said, "Sure," you know, and I'd go for a ten mile. You know, somebody joined me for ten miles or something, and at, at, when they when we parted, we would 
have a, a bosom friendship, a bosom love that was quite intense for a short period of time, you know. So I would say to the teenager, I say, D- you know, do me, a, do yourself a favor this summer and take a long walk with a stranger and then let them become a bosom friend. And I think what I missed until I started to say this to you just now is that is, that is also the way to cultivate a relationship with the spiritual world. Don't sit, dance, or take a long walk contemplating your own angel, contemplating the nature beings who bring the green world into fruition every spring and then die away in the fall. Walking in silence with your mind attuned to an object of devotion, be it a dying loved one or a a yet-to-be-born new child with in mind your own guardian angel or those those beings it it creates a a deep deep bond that that is a it's a very simple practice it's a very simple practice and one that that yields immense results i think we haven't really talked about emerson and the other transcendentalist um and thoreau's relationship with him we ought, we know that thoreau had a really intense relationship with emerson he lived with him and his family for a bit um, lived on walden pond but as you describe in the book, it seemed as the men, as these men got older, they, I don't, there was sort of an estrangement. Like Emerson went one way, Thoreau went another. It often seemed that the other transcendentalists that they worked with, like they didn't really get Thoreau. I mean, what, 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 how was Thoreau different from these other guys? And what, why did these other guys didn't totally accept or, or just yeah, understand what Thoreau was doing? Yeah, it's... Um... It's a deep tragedy, really. He had a capacity for friendship that was immense, uh, immense. And we have this, we have this caricature view of him today that he was a misanthrope, right? And it's, it's still, it still hangs on. And I, I'd hate to see it, say it was just, you know, that traditionally is described as, well, Emerson was disappointed that Thoreau did not become that great uh, bard that, you know, Emerson, Emerson himself, you know, you always have this generational thing where a, a great man wants to see his own boyhood or, you know, youthful dreams fulfilled in another as he's maturing into his own path. You know, it's, it's odd with Emerson because Emerson, right at the cusp at age 30, which is a very, very pivotal biographical year in, in any anyone's life. You know, Emerson had had this mystical vision at, at the Jardin des Plantes in, in in Paris, where he said, "I will become a naturalist." And you know, this was a turning of the back on on theology, on becoming a Unitarian divine, like was expected of him. And of course, no, he didn't become a great naturalist. It was Thoreau who became a great naturalist. And I would say. Uh, that his own poetic aspirations, you know, Emerson wrote some pretty good poetry, but you just take one, any, any one of, of Emerson's best known poems and then take any Thoreau poem, which are completely unknown. And Thoreau's are the better, you know, Thoreau's are modern. They're, they're sprightly and, and full of force. So Thoreau, both poetically and in terms of being a naturalist, he did, I believe, completely fulfill these these prophetic and deeply held Emersonian desires. I think it was just that uh, Emerson kind of became victim to a kind of bourgeois expectations. You know, he was a guy who moved in, in somewhat aristocratic intellectual and social circles. And Henry was uh, a ne'er-do-well. Henry was a guy who went naked, you know, and wore his straw hat, went in the buff across Concord river and the Assabet river and, and was still collecting frogs, you know, when he was a grown man. Thoreau remained childlike in spirit in a way that his Emerson's own children and the children of Concord knew instantly and responded to instinctively. And, um, you know, I, uh, this is something we is true today. The child man will always end up being the, um, uh, the kind of, the, he, will not be looked upon kindly by by any community 
just because of our own sort of bourgeois ideals about what it is to be a man. I mean, here we're coming to the heart of your, you know, the, a theme of, of your, of your work. And, um, you know, we've made, we've grown in a lot of ways to, to expand the ideal of, of manhood. I think Thoreau had an expanded, a more expanded and a more, um, divine manhood within him that exceeded the expectations of his time in a way that they just couldn't, they couldn't take it in. Well, I mean, so you've, you've mentioned that, you know, after writing this biography, you've changed, you know, when you go on walks, the way you observe, but I'm curious, do you think it's possible for us moderns here living in our digital world to re-enchant and see the world like Thoreau did? Or do you think the toothpaste is out of the bottle and there's no going back to, to that? Oh man. Oh, um, uh, there's no alternative. We have to, we have to. And, you know, I would that there, maybe, maybe young people could tell me who for them, you know, is, is fulfilling this role as a kind of model, but maybe, maybe we're, we're post models at this point. We have to be our own models. And I do absolutely believe that every generation and particularly in America, because we have such a karmic burden as the most technologically addicted and spreading illusions around the world, we uh, we have the the karmic responsibility to pioneer and practice faithfully, and then if if so called to share with with others an enchanted science and one that that discovers rediscovers the reality of the elemental world the, the fairies that understands there's a relationship be the, between the angelic world and and the elemental beings you know i i read richard powers the overstory uh, have you read it Brad? i have not but you know it's it's a he's in it he's he's an incredibly gifted writer and it's a it's a beautiful book and and I think captures the captures in a sense your question in a in a novelistic fashion that for both my generation and and for for young people today that is um, would be very arresting and yet I, I as I read it I felt like you know for all of the it, it's a it's a it's a tragic story about dedicated activists seeking to give nature specifically trees standing you know to give those beings the be the trees as as individual beings a kind of um ability to to hold sovereignty the way the human being does and it's going to be a a long time coming but i think children know i think every generation of children know know these things and we will you know, we'll eventually come around to providing them the Hogwarts that they, that they're asking for. We have to, nature is, is, is showing us that, uh, that we can't, we can't go forward in the way we have in the past. So it's, it's totally possible. And, and I have to echo Henry's, um, Henry's motto, you know, expect great things. If we expect them, they will come. Believe me, they will come. Well, Kevin, this has been a great conversation. Is there anywhere someone can go to find out more about your work? Sure. I'm uh, drdan.com, D-R-D-A-N-N.com. And all my books are there and all my essays. And um, yeah, I, I invite people to look for in July 12th on Henry's 201st birthday, Penguin's bringing out a book called The Road to Walden, which is about my walk from uh, a foot of Broadway up to Concord, up to Walden Pond. And my dialogue, my inner dialogue with with Henry, and it's been such a great opportunity to chat with you, Brett. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. For your time, it's been a pleasure. 
My guest today was Dr. Kevin Dan. He's the author of the book, Expect Great Things, The Life and Search of Henry David Thoreau. You can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about his work at drdan.com. And he's got a new book coming out in July about his walk to Walden. It's come from Manhattan to Walden Pond. Uh, it's coming out July 12th. It's called The Road to Walden. So check that out if you are interested in that. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash expect great things, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.